so uh, today I'm going to tell you about my work on uh, efficient and scalable packet scheduling software. Uh, the work was done in collaboration with my advisors and colleagues at Georgia Tech. It was also done in collaboration with colleagues at Google and Carnegie Mellon University. So before I tell you about the details of the work, let me give you a little bit of context. This work can be implemented in multiple settings, but let's focus on the data center setting. In particular, let's focus on just one machine in the data center. So in modern data centers, uh, servers will be pushing multiple types of traffic. They can be pushing user-facing high-priority web traffic, they can be pushing high-priority back-end traffic, and they can be also pushing lower-priority uh, copy traffic, for instance, for, like for uh, replication. So the way this fits in current uh, networks is something like this, where the server is connected to other machines in the data center through the data center network, and the data center is connected to the rest of the world through Wendings. Uh, traffic will go something like this, where uh, the web traffic will go through the WAN to the, to, to the internet, and then the back-end traffic will go to other machines in the data center, and then the copy traffic will also go, also go through the WAN to other data centers. <coughs> So this can cause multiple congestion and multiple uh, conflicts in the network, uh, in the WAN, at the source, and uh, in, in the data center LAN. These are all classical problems, right? Like we've been working on these problems for years. Uh, however, what keeps these problems alive is the scale that current networks are operating at. Current servers can be serving tens of thousands of flows. Current links can be operating at very high speeds, giving very small time budget per packet. And there is a diversity in both types of traffic as well as the uh, policies needed to mandate their interaction. Solving e any of these problems requires some form of scheduling. Where what I mean by scheduling is the determination or rel of relative ordering of packets and as well as their transmission time according to some ranking function. And the defining this ranking function has been at the center of many uh, uh, research efforts on traffic isolation, flow completion time optimization, as well as congestion control. Packet scheduling can be implemented in multiple places in the network. They can be implemented in hardware and they can be implemented in software. They can be implemented in hardware as uh, uh, in FPGAs or ASICs or MPUs, in switches or NICs, and they can also be implemented in software in kernel, in the TCP IP stack, or in at the kernel queuing disciplines, or QDisk for short. They can be also implemented in user space uh, settings. This is just to show you the diversity of the settings where packet scheduling is typically used. In this work, we focus on software, and the reason we do that is that we found that so, uh, hardware uh, typically lags behind network needs. While current servers can be pushing tens of thousands of flows, current net network cards will provide us with few thousand, maybe 10,000 queues, hardware queues. Another, another advantage of software is that it provides a very good experimentation uh, 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 playground for testing new building blocks and new algorithms at, low, at relatively co low cost compared to uh, testing using hardware. The third uh, advantage of software is that it provides sort of a build once, deploy many, where we can practically use the same code for middle box or end hosts. Software or even hardware scheduling is challenging for multiple reasons. This includes accurate scheduling. For instance, in packet, uh, uh, in, pay, in rate limiting, we want to avoid this sort of bursty uh, uh, rate limiting uh, behavior and we'd rather have it like more paced. But this leads to higher CPU utilization, which leads us to the second challenge. Keeping the CPU and memory uh, overhead of software schedulers is a challenge, and as the overhead of uh, software schedulers, or even hardware schedulers, are typically order log n, where n is the number of packets scheduled or flows scheduled, which makes the overhead of the scheduler a function of the load. We'd rather have it as a function of the policy, where regardless of the load, the overhead of a specific policy is constant. The third, the third challenge is the diversity of requirements. Modern uh, network operators would like to be able to implement multiple scheduling policies, for instance, uh, hierarchical scheduling policies, uh, strict priority policies, rate limiting, or even experimenting with uh, other uh, uh, ranking policies, ranking functions like uh, shortest remaining time first. This led us to our objective, which is designing an accurate, efficient, and programmable software scheduler. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you how we did this, 
First, I'm going to t t tell you uh, about the scheduler architecture and, how, and what parts of the scheduler architecture we focus on in our work on Eiffel. In order to explain how we arrived our, at our optimizations, we're going to examine a little bit the characteristics of packet ranks, which will lead us to uh, the efficient building block for Eiffel, which is the integer, pr integer priority queue. And finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we use the efficient building block to extend the programmability of software schedulers al as long, al along with some uh, brief uh, uh, introduction of our evaluation. So uh, packet schedulers look something like this, where you have uh, flow sources sending packets to some annotator that, ad that annotates packets with the rank according to the ranking function. Then packets are enqueued to a priority queue, where packets are ordered ac according to the rank. Then they're sent out in order to the NIC. The annotator, as well as the queuing data structure, can change according to uh, the scheduling policy. Different scheduling policies can, will change this architecture a little bit. In our work in Eiffel, we focus on two components, particularly the queuing data structure, because that's where most of the CPU overhead is, and the scheduling policy description, which gives us the flexibility to accommodate diversity. So in particular, we want to have uh, efficient uh, priority queues that can handle uh, packet ordering at line rate, as well as expressive abstractions that allows us to capture a large range of scheduling policies. So in order to do that, we had to examine the characteristics of packet ranks. The first characteristic, which is quite obvious, is that packet ranks are integers, typically represented by a finite number of bits, let's say W bits. And this is typically needed even in, in, to add a packet rank in, the, in a TCP header, like in, option, in the options field. This is true for almost all types of packet ranks, like quas-based priority uh, or cross-based ranks, time-based ranks, or flow size-based ranks. The second characteristic is that packet ranks have known ranges. Within the e expressive, uh, 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 expressiveness of uh, W bits from 0 to 2 to the power W, we're typically interested in a small range within the, tra within the general range. For instance, in time-based priorities, we're only interested in ranges from now to a few seconds in the future. We're not interested in scheduling packets in the past, and we're not interested in scheduling packets at more than a few seconds in the future. We're also in flow size based priorities. We're interested in a small uh, range that is de de dependent on the typical behavior of applications in the, uh, in the network we're operating on. The second characteristic, the, sec the, the third example is strict priority, where the ranges are typically defined by the policy or the network operator. The third characteristic of packet ranks is that packets are processed in batches. This is, this is sort of a byproduct, but it's important. Uh, while applications can push uh, traffic at high speeds and network cards will require packets at a high frequency, there is typically this unavoidable sort of latency for the network processing system. This requires the network processing system to process packets in batches, rendering packets within the same batch to have virtually the same rank. This means that we don't care really about small differences in packet ranks. And these three characteristics lead, leads us to the following interesting observation, is that bucketed data structures are very useful to provide accurate scheduling. Another thing is that with limited range of integer uh, rank values, we have a limited number of buckets. Uh, the only remaining part is, find, uh, is developing an algorithm that can find the minimum non-empty bucket uh, efficiently, or the maximum non-empty bucket efficiently. Let, that led us to integer priority queues. Before I tell you a little bit about integer priority queues, which is the efficient building block at, uh, uh, in, in, at the heart of Eiffel, let me like, sort of go over a few, like uh, over priority queues 101. So in a typical algorithms course, you'll hear about priority queues as binary trees, binomial heaps, or Fibonacci heaps. They look something like this, where you have at, uh, the minimum or maximum element at the root. They support uh, efficiently uh, extract min or extract max. Their overhead is typically log n for insertion, extraction, or both. And they typically require like simply defining uh, a comparison operator. They're, they're generally called comparison-based uh, priority queues. And they're very powerful because they, they are very generic. However, we know that packet ranks are more specific. So this gets us to integer priority queues that look something like this. They're bucketed this structure of n buckets. Buckets are index, indexed based on the priority. This makes the in, uh, overhead of insertion or changing the priority order one because you simply look up the bucket by its index. Also, they, can, they support order lock to the base W of N uh, for extract min or extract max. There are better bounds in, in, in theory work, but this specific bound is important because it can be 
very efficiently implemented in software. And, and if you take a look at, at these uh, characteristics of integer priority queues, you'll see two things. First, the overhead of the priority queue is determined by n, where n is the range or the number of priorities we have, which is a function really of the, uh, of the uh, scheduling policy, not a function of the load. Also, it's mandated by the, uh, the number of bits taken to represent the priority. That way, for a specific, a specific uh, scheduling policy, the overhead of the integer priority queue is fixed, regardless of the load. In, uh, there are multiple Im possible implementation for integer priority queues, and uh, we, fo we took two approaches. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start with one, and the other one is in the paper. I'm gonna just give you a little hint about it uh, towards the end. So we started using FFS-based integer priority queues. FFS is a CPU op operation that finds the first set bit in a word. So uh, pretty much in a 64-bit CPU, we can find the first set bit in three CPU cycles. This means that we can implement an integer priority queue with 64 buckets in practically order one. This idea is not new. Uh, find first set based priority queues has been, are, are currently used in, in the Linux kernel for real-time uh, process scheduling. And FFS-based operation has been used for efficient implementation of specific packet scheduling algorithms. However, in order to achieve that, the goals we start, uh, I started talking about, uh, we need to, uh, we need a more generic uh, data structure or building block. This led us to hierarchical find first set based queues where the occupancy of the queue or the occupancy of the buckets are, is represented by a hierarchy of words where you figure out the minimum element by recursively uh, executing the FFS on the hierarchy representing the queue occupancy. However, the, the limitation of this data structure is that it does not support moving ranges. For instance, in time-based priority, uh, in time-based priority prioritization, we typically operate over, over a moving range. The challenge here is that it's very CPU inefficient to keep modifying the metadata as the as we move over time range. To solve this problem, we traded memory uh, memory for CPU efficiency by adding a secondary priority queue. That way, the moving range can move between the primary and the secondary queue. And once the primary queue is is empty, it becomes the secondary queue, and so on. This leads to a, a, a relatively small memory footprint because the uh, memory it takes to store the buckets as well as the metadata is quite small compared to the packet overhead, as well as it allows us to uh, implement order lock to the base W here, W is 64 of N where N is the number of uh, priorities. In the paper, we, uh, we, we present a, a second type of priority queues that, uh, that relies on approximation and provides order one uh, insertion and extraction for specific cases. Uh, but it's for time, I'm not going to talk about it here. The second interest in Eiffel was to extend the expressiveness of, scheduler, uh, of programmable schedulers. From that, we start from uh, earlier work on, uh, on the PIFO programming model. The PIFO, PIFO stands for push in first out queues. PIFO was uh, presented by Anirudh three, three years ago. It represents uh, policies as a hierarchy of priority queues. Uh, where packets are ranked individually on in queue. Scheduling and shaping are tightly coupled in the nodes of the hierarchy. And all of this is implemented in hardware, uh, which limited the expressiveness as, uh, of, as, as well as the scale of the system. In Eiffel, we wanted to extend this. So particularly, we make three, three extensions. The first one is that we allow packets to be uh, ordered based on their individual ranks as well as the flow rank. We also allow packet ranks and flow ranks to be done on in queue and dequeue, and we decouple shaping and scheduling. This seems a little bit dry, so I'll just focus on, with an example, on the first extension. The rest of them, you can see the details on the paper. So an example of this, uh, it, it, the example we use here is pfabric. So uh, pfabric achieves near optimal uh, flow completion time, uh, and it uses shortest remaining time uh, first uh, uh, ranking of packets. In order to prevent starvation, uh, pfabric allows packets belonging to the, to the flow with the smallest rank to go out first. In particular, in this example, the blue flow has uh, a packet rank 60, so all of the blue flow packets go first. However, if the red uh, flow gets a packet rank 40, then something like this has to happen. All, fl uh, all packets belonging to the red flow has to go out first. Uh, this requires reordering packets already in queued in the, in, in the data structure, which was not supported the, by the PIFO model. 
the way we uh, extend the Python model in order to allow this is by allowing packets to be ordered based on their flow rank. In particular, we allow something like this. So packets within the same flow are ordered in a FIFO manner, where every incoming packet will update the flow rank. That way, when the, uh, when the red flow gets a new packet, it will simply change its, its rank within the priority queue, and we've already discussed that integer priority queues achieve order one uh, for, uh, for changing the priority. Uh, in, in the paper, we uh, evaluated this in multiple settings. We evaluated it in user space setting, in kernel setting. We can compared it to multiple state-of-the-art schedulers. But in, uh, in the slides, I'm just going to focus on the pfabric implementation. We implemented uh, uh, a pfabric instance using binary heaps and using Eiffel uh, in BES that uh, we experimented in lab machines connected with 10 gigabits per second. Uh, uh, links and we deploy it on a single core just to test the capacity of a single core. This is the result we got where the x axis is the number of flows and the y axis is the aggregate rate of all flows. Ideally we want this, uh, uh, this graph to provide like sort of a, 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 a straight line where the aggregate rate is independent of the number of flows. However, what we get is that with Eiffel, we improve the maximum, uh, the capacity of the system by 5x in terms of the number of flows it can support. Uh, with this, I'm going to, uh, to conclude my, uh, my talk. I think the two high level uh, takeaways from our work in Eiffel is that Eiffel will allow packet, uh, network operators to implement packet scheduling in, uh, or more diverse set of packet schedulers in uh, end hosts as well as middle boxes. And we also think that the advantages of Eiffel motivate rethinking the building blocks of packet scheduling and hardware. Thank you. Hi, uh, Vishal Srivastava, Cornell University. Uh, cool work. So my question was, how does your system scale with increasing link speeds? For example, if say you have like 100 Gbps link speeds, right? Now all of a sudden, if you're scheduling 1500 byte packets, a single DRAM access is gonna be taking like 100 nanoseconds, which is pretty close to the time it takes to transmit a 1500 byte packet on say 100 Gbps link. So how does your system scale with increasing link speeds? Uh, thank you for the question, that's a good question so um, the this this question really scales to all software uh, networking stacks uh, and and typically what happens is that if you want to scale to larger line rates and you hit the capacity of a single core you will you will move to more to add more cores our goal with this work is really to uh, improve the scheduling component within the stack in order to not make that the bottleneck so this is based on our observation that one of like deploying or the the, or the bottleneck or the uh, roadblock uh, in front of deploying complex scheduling policies is, is really this problem, like the overhead of the individual uh, scheduling policy. So what we're trying to do is pretty much take that out of the equation. And we started doing that with rate limiting and then we moved to scheduling. And I think the conclusion is what we did was make scheduling such a small piece of the software stack that your bottleneck is typically just the software stack as a whole, not, not the scheduling part. Uh, just a follow-up question, just yeah. a meta question. So is it, is it the case that you're saying that if, as we are moving to higher link speeds, a better design would be to actually move the scheduler to the hardware rather than the software? Is that the conclusion? Uh, well, that's, that's a very good question. That's sort of a tough question. I think in general, uh, or at least that's my personal belief, is that all of the experimentation in software, and this is sort of what I said in the talk, all of the experimentation we do in software is, is sort of a precursor to finer deployments in hardware. So I think the work on Eiffel is sort of a one step in that direction where we experiment in software in order to change the building blocks in hardware. But whether we want to end up building, building uh, the building components in software or hardware, that's a much bigger question beyond the scope of this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had a question. Uh, do you know how the performance uh, is if you don't have the FFS instruction? Like, does it degrade gracefully, or do you just fall off? 
Um, so that's a good question. So what we, so in, in the paper we experimented with this uh, a, 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 a float point based operation uh, or flow, based, uh, flow point based uh, priority queue and the performance was sort of comparable. However, the FFS based operation is like adds, uh, improves its performance significantly. Uh, and one, one good observation here is that the FFS operation is zero. In, in the paper we experimented with this uh, a, 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 a float point based operation uh, or flow, based, uh, flow point based uh, priority queue and the performance was sort of comparable. However, the FFS based operation is, like, adds, uh, improves its performance significantly. Uh, and one, one good observation here is that the FFS operation is really supported in almost all current CPUs, even special purpose ones, so it's, uh, it's a really efficient operation. Um, I would say, so the one, one thing that we hit, one, one, one sort of uh, block that we hit here is that we, we think that CPU efficiency with even a small FFS based queue is, is quite good that we start running into memory problems. So I think even if we uh, increase the, the number of bits that the FFS based queue supports, we'll still run into memory problems of fetching packets and, 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 and these sort of, uh, and, and, and cache misses and these sort of problems. So, uh, so I don't think it will add a big improvement, unless it's coupled with uh, a very fast memory. <laughs>